I'm Janelle Davis with Carolina Pro Musica, and today I'm going to talk to you about the violin. Carolina Pro Musica focuses on music written before 1800 and performs using instruments or copies of instruments from the period of time in which this music was written. So a question I often get is, why do you need two violins? Well, this is my Baroque violin, and this is my modern violin. I use my Baroque violin to play music composed up through about the 18th century, and I generally use my modern violin to perform music written after that. I think that playing music on the types of equipment for which it was composed makes certain things easier and allows me to play the music more beautifully. Both violins look somewhat the same, same shape, four strings, two f-holes, a scroll, a bridge, about the same size. You might notice some hardware differences, a fine tuner, a chin rest, maybe shoulder support on the modern violin. A major development of the construction of the modern violin is the neck, which on the modern violin is put in at more of an angle. This increases tension on the instrument for a more powerful sound. You might also notice a difference in the Baroque violin and the modern violin in the material on the upper strings. This earlier violin is strung with gut, organic material made from sheep or cow intestine, and I think that organic, meaning living matter, is a good way to describe the sound of these strings, which have more subtle nuance than the metal or synthetic material that came to be used for strings on the modern violin post-World War II. Until that time, it was normal for violinists to use gut strings, but the metal is a bit more efficient in terms of stability of pitch as well as projection. And the use of metal strings makes for a very clean sound, but can lack the depth and richness of a gut string. And so the adoption of metal strings really seems to go hand in hand with the use of continuous vibrato to spin the tone and give direction to this more direct sound produced by these strings. tools and techniques in historical performance practice. The most expressive tool a Baroque string player has in hand is the bow. It is what we use to speak the music. Bows prior to 1780 were not standard in size, length, weight, shape. Various bows developed alongside the repertoire as the requirements of the repertoire changed. So did the bows, allowing the player to make the music speak with the most ease and in the most effective way. Here is a 17th century model bow, and I'll go ahead and hold it up next to my modern bow. You'll notice right away that it's quite a lot shorter. The short bow has a pointy tip, the modern one, a hammer-shaped head. This block of wood on the other end of the bow is called a frog. The frog on my modern bow is closed with a metaphor rule, and it has a wider ribbon of hair. The modern bow also has a screw mechanism, which makes it easy to adjust the tension of the bow hair. It adds a lot of weight to the frog, so the balance is quite different. The frog on this early bow clips in and out. When I take out the frog, you can really see how this looks like a mini archery bow. Notice how the modern bow has a dip and this earlier bow does not. The short bow is ideal for music written by composers such as Monteverdi or Castello. It's quick, it's light, fleet, it's very articulate, and it really excels at playing music with lots of diminutions. To tighten the hair, you might use strips of leather. 
instead of that screw mechanism so that you can play with enough tension on those bow hairs. Perhaps you would hold it, the bow with the thumb under the frog, and the violin position might also have the lower on the shoulder. Music often didn't go out of first position at this time, so moving your hand to play higher up the fingerboard wouldn't have been much of a concern. Chin rests were developed much later by Spohr in the 1820s to help facilitate that playing in the higher positions. generally got longer in the 18th century and there was often a distinction between French dance bows which were heavier at the frog and sonata bows which catered to the Italian style of Baroque instrumental music that had longer phrases and double stops. Here is an 18th century Italian sonata bow. I really love playing Bach with this bow and it is also appropriate for the high Baroque music of Veracini and Locatelli, Handel and Telemann. You can see by comparison to the modern bow, it still has a lot less hair. It's longer than that 17th century bow, but it still has a slightly bowed out shape and a pointy tip. If I pull just a note on the Baroque bow, frog to tip, the sound you will hear will make the same shape as this bow, which starts bigger at the frog and gets softer and smaller at the tip. toward Haydn and Mozart, bows start to change a lot. Here is a transitional bow. It still has this open frog and the head is sort of a swan bill shape now, but you can also see a very intentional concave rather than convex shape. The camber of the bow stick evens out the tension on the hair a bit and that also evens out the sound. which represents the sort of culmination of bow development to its standardized shape as we know it today. This model was actually around a lot earlier than what you might think, as early as the 1750s, but it really took off with the bow maker Francois Tort in the 1780s. The thing that this bow does very well is the sustained sound. It has quite a lot of hair, as we've talked about, and you can really make a big, round, satisfying sound with this bow, but with some trade-offs in agility and articulation of the other earlier bows. As a musician who thinks a lot about performance practice, the sound possibilities that historical violins and bows provide really excites me. But then we must also explore how to use this equipment in a style appropriate to the time and place and purpose for which the music was written. This is what really informs and enlivens the music. So let's take for an example an 18th century French approach to bowing and contrast it with an Italian system of bowing from about the same time. Remember the frog is heavier and the tip, especially on a Baroque bow, is lighter so a down bow is automatically more accented than an up bow. But string players don't just play one note for every down bow or up bow stroke. We can and do come up with endless combinations of bowing. In France, in the Baroque era, much of the music was for the accompaniment of dance. From this grew a system of bowing that gave very clear patterns of strong and weak beats so that the dancers could essentially step in time. Georg Mouffat wrote this French system down and from it we can get a really clear picture of a very rhythmic and articulated style with lots of lifts and retakes of the bow. 
Now, Mufat was hugely influential, but even during the Baroque era, his system wasn't universal. So we have to be careful that we don't apply Mufat's rules willy-nilly to say contrapuntal music, or even a lot of Italian music from the same time period. For that, we can look to the Boeing instruction from composers and writers such as Tartini, or Gemignani, or Quantz, who incidentally advocated practicing Boeing the wrong direction in order to navigate more easily the inherent inequality of the heavier down bow and lighter up bow. But this is perhaps a bigger topic for another video. Suffice it to say that the music of the past feels different, sounds different, and is different when you play it thinking about the style and the instrument of a particular